truth in its essence is not a something. It is a somebody. His name is Jesus Christ. When truth is called a lie, the lights go out, darkness falls, and indeed, if your light is darkness, how very deep will the darkness be? All the words in this book can be compressed into one word, the eternal word, Jesus the Christ. Today, of course, we're going to finish part four of the Catechism of the Catholic Church on prayer. Now, the fact that the section on prayer is the smallest section in the Catechism and it comes last in the Catechism doesn't mean that it's the least important. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, it's the most important. Without prayer, you can do nothing. Without prayer, we really can't have faith. Without prayer, we certainly can't celebrate the Paschal Mystery. Without prayer, we can't live the life of Christ. And those are the first three sections of the Catechism that I mentioned. So prayer is really a relationship. Prayer isn't just saying some words. Prayer is a real, personal, intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ who draws us into himself and through the power of the Holy Spirit making us one with Jesus we gain entrance into the Father into the Father's presence the Father's own life and so prayer really is an entrance into the life and mission of Jesus Christ which brings us into the life of the Most Holy Trinity the Catechism tells us about the wellsprings of prayer. The Holy Spirit is the living water welling up to eternal life. And this wellspring bubbles up in the heart of the person who prays. You remember what happened in the Old Testament at Meribah? The people had been wandering through the desert and they had no water. And they were very thirsty and they thought they were going to die. And so they turned to Moses and they complained against Moses and against God and they said why did you bring us out here to perish we have no water and so Moses like a good mediator a good intercessor he took it to the Lord and the Lord told, told Moses take the staff with which you parted the waters and strike the rock the rock at Meribah and Moses struck the rock and water flowed out of that rock now that's an Old Testament type, a prefigurement of what would happen in the New Testament. Jesus is the rock. God is the rock of our salvation. The, the wood, the staff, that's the cross, the wood of the cross. And so the rock, Jesus, when struck with the wood of the cross, when he was crucified and died and rose again, that opened Christ, the wounded side of Christ, out of which flowed blood and water, the Holy Spirit was then turned loose in a torrent upon the church. And the Holy Spirit, that's the wellspring of water which bubbles up to eternal life. Those welling up waters, that deep well, that inexhaustible well of grace, bubbles up in the heart who prays. Some of the saints have said, St. Alphonsus Liguori and others, the person who prays is surely saved. The person who does not pray cannot be saved. And so that's a rather radical statement by a saint and a doctor of the church, but they know the mind of God better than we do. And so we have to pray. There are several wellsprings of prayer, ways that we can meet the Lord Jesus, and one of these is the Word of God. The church forcefully and especially exhorts all the Christian faithful to learn the surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ.
by frequent reading of the divine scriptures. Let them remember, however, that prayer should accompany the reading of sacred scripture. Okay, when you read the Bible, and we should read it in one form or another every day. Of course, if you go to Mass daily, we have readings at Holy Mass. But prayer should accompany the reading of sacred scripture. Invoke the Holy Spirit. You will never learn what the scriptures have to tell you merely by being a scholar. That's important, but it's not enough. Unless you pray and invoke the Holy Spirit, who is the author of the Word of God in the first place, the primary author of sacred scripture is God the Holy Spirit. And unless you enter into the power and light of the Holy Spirit, you will remain an amateur and an outsider no matter how many degrees you have and no matter how much you study. And so prayer must accompany reading of sacred scripture if you would get what you need to get out of this. Let the people of God remember that prayer should accompany the reading of sacred scripture and directly invoke the Holy Spirit. We have to have a dialogue between God and us. The spiritual writers, paraphrasing Matthew 7, 7, summarize the disposition we should have when they tell us, seek in reading and you will find in meditating. Knock in mental prayer, meditation, and it will be open to you by contemplation. The word of God is one of the wellsprings, one of the essential prerequisites of advancing in prayer. We build our prayer life, our whole life, on the word of God. We should have great reverence for the word of God. Another wellspring of prayer is the liturgy, the sacred liturgy, the sacramental liturgy, Holy Mass, the Eucharist, all of the sacraments. In the sacramental liturgy of the church, the catechism teaches us, the mission of Christ and of the Holy Spirit proclaims makes present and communicates the mystery of salvation which is continued in the heart that prays. And so the liturgy is an essential wellspring for those who pray. Uh, Holy Mass especially, the Eucharist. A person who wants to be a real person of prayer has to have their life centered on that which is the center of the church's life. And that's the Holy Eucharist, and there's just no getting away from it. You have to center your life on the Eucharist. That means the high point of any day for, for us has to be the celebration of the Eucharist. Now, I know that we can't all go to Mass every day. I understand that. But still, your heart should be where the Lord is in the Eucharist, so you can make spiritual communions. You stay united, even if you can't go uh, to daily Mass. You stay united with the Eucharistic Lord in your heart and in your mind. The theological virtues, faith, hope, and charity, which are first infused at baptism, uh, these are also a wellspring for prayer. They're a way that we enter into Jesus, who is the source of prayer. We come through the narrow gate of faith. Right? When we enter prayer, just like entering into the liturgy, we enter by the narrow gate, which is faith. You have to have faith. Also, the Holy Spirit, who instructs us to celebrate the liturgy in expectation of Christ's return, teaches us to pray in hope. You have to be a person of hope. I just finished giving a retreat to Mother Teresa of Calcutta's sisters, the missionaries of charity. I gave a retreat in San Francisco last week to all of the novices of the missionaries of charity in the Western Hemisphere, from Canada, the United States, Mexico, Central and South America. I'll be talking throughout this day about some of the experiences I had with the sisters in San Francisco. Uh, it was profound. It was tremendous. Uh, the missionaries of charity, probably more than any other active religious institute I know of, are living the charism which their foundress received from the Holy Spirit 
and that's not unusual. Every religious order lives the charism of their founder or foundress very intensely in the early days. You know, it, the test is later, after mother's gone, can they retain that fervor? And I spoke to them quite at length for eight days about what they have to do to retain that fervor, and you better not lose it, because you've been given the pearl of great, great price. All of us have been given a treasure, and it behooves us to hold on to that treasure, to nurture that treasure, to cherish that treasure, and to hand it on faithfully to those who come after us. And everybody here today, and all of you who are so faithful all year, you have that responsibility, and I know that's why you're here. You take it seriously. You, of all people, have to hand on the faith intact to succeeding generations, not in a diluted form, not in a mitigated, vitiated, or distorted form, intact, just the way we received it in the beginning from the Lord Jesus who gave it to his apostles who handed it on to their successors, the bishops, in union with the Bishop of Rome. We have an awesome, an awesome responsibility to hand on the doctrine of the faith, the teaching of Jesus Christ. You can't do it. You can't do it unless you are a person of intense prayer. We're not all religious. I know that. Well, we're religious people but we're not members of religious orders. But nonetheless, <clears throat> your job as lay people is definitely no easier than mine as a priest or the sisters. As sisters, you know very well that you have a tough job to raise a family, to be faithful, to be a good husband to your wife, a good wife to your husband, good parents to your children. No easy task. Your job is every bit as hard as my job, maybe harder. Now, I'll give you an example, as I will all day. The sisters, the missionaries of charity, are active. They work among the poorest of the poor. They have an apostolate. They pray vocal prayer two and a half hours a day. They have an hour of adoration before the, the exposed Blessed Sacrament. They have mass. They spend about five hours a day in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Now, these are active sisters. These are not contemplative nuns. And that's where the power came from. One little person, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, left her convent at Loreto to begin this work among the poorest of the poor. She had nothing, five rupees in her pocket. That's next to nothing. And she went out into the street and gathered some little street children and began to teach them in a corner. And that's where it began. Now over 5,000 sisters missionaries of charity in her own lifetime, over 500 houses of the missionaries of charity all over the world. Why? How did they do that? Prayer. Prayer. Union with God. Union with God is where all power comes from. No prayer, no union with God. No union with God, no power. The apostolate collapses. People burn out and they leave their vocation whether priest, religious, or lay. Prayer is the rock that you'd better build your house on, lest the storms and strife of time come along and blow your house away. Don't build your house on shifting sands. Don't build your house on personal opinions. Build your house on the rock-solid foundation of Christ who tells us we must pray. And so, first and foremost, be a person of prayer. The Holy Spirit is a formaker. I always tell people when I give retreats or missions, it's, I'm not the one who's doing this. If I am, go home, because I don't really have anything that important to tell you. But the Holy Spirit works through instruments. The Holy Spirit can, can play a beautiful symphony even on a broken violin. And so despite the deficiencies and even the sins of someone like me, the Holy Spirit works through us, through me, through you, through any of us, if we let him. 
And how do we let him? We say yes. We say, yes, Lord, I will be a person of prayer. I will enter into intimacy with you. Mother Teresa always tells her sisters, you know, I worry that some of you haven't yet entered into a personal, intimate relationship with the person, Jesus. Oh, we go to chapel, we spend hours, we do all kind of spiritual exercises, but do you know Jesus in your heart? You have to know the Lord in your heart. Do you go into that silent place within to meet the beloved? If you do not, you cannot carry on the work of the gospel. And don't be deceived by that gross deception which says all you have to do is the work. What you have to do is pray so you can do the work. You know, the missionaries of charity are taught, pray the work. In other words, you don't just do the work like you're a social worker. Nothing wrong with social workers. But social workers aren't religious. And religious have a different obligation. Pray the work, but never, never can we substitute the work for prayer. For if you stop praying and say, I don't have time to pray, I'm too busy with the work, the work will collapse. And so I make this point strongly. Part four of the Catechism, if you haven't read it yet, you read it, please. Please read every word of it and read it prayerfully. That section on prayer, read it prayerfully. Invoke the Holy Spirit. If you will interiorize the section on prayer in the Catechism, everything else will fall into place. Why? Because Scripture, which is the word of truth, tells us, Seek first the kingdom of God, and all things else will be given unto you. How do you seek first the kingdom of God? Through prayer. Prayer gains you an entrance into the life and mission of Jesus Christ. If you do that first, everything else will be okay. I have so many people that tell me, Oh, Father, I have this problem and that problem. I'm dying from cancer. My son is dying from AIDS and I just can't go on. What can I do? My advice is the same. And it sounds too simple. And so it goes over people's heads unless I pound on them. And I do. <laughs> pray! Oh, but Father, I pray. Pray some more. Are you praying properly? We're going to talk about the dispositions for prayer. Trust is one of them. Do you trust God? Do you really trust God? I don't trust God like I should, Father. I understand. Neither do I. So what must, what must we do? Pray for trust. Very simple. Pray for trust. But I have a hard time persevering in prayer, Father. My prayer so dry. Pray for perseverance. Get it? If you've got a deficiency, <laughs> right? What do you do? You pray to overcome the deficiencies. Honestly, it's so simple, but you know, God, by definition, theologically, is pure simplicity. And so don't think, because it sounds so simple, it can't be true. I guarantee you, because it's so simple, it is true. Because God's the truth, and God, by definition, is pure simplicity. And so please believe me, prayer is the answer to everything. How can you be answered if you don't ask? Knock and it will be opened unto you. Seek and you will find. Ask. Surely God will answer you. So please, let that sink in. Love is the source of prayer. Is love something? No. Love is somebody, not something. Love is a person. Love is three persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's love. That's the source of prayer. God is the source of prayer personified love. The Father sent his Son to show us what love means. And the Son and the Father give us the Holy Spirit who moves within us, who conforms us to Jesus. And so, love is the source of prayer. And whoever draws from it reaches the summit of prayer. The great Saint John Vianney, the Corrie d'Ars, says, I love you, O my God. And we have to be able to say this with the saint. I love you, O oh my God. And as a matter of fact, 
since our God is here in this way, I'm just joining all of your intentions to my prayer, and we're not just reading this, we're praying this. And we're praying this to the Lord who is right here in our midst, Emmanuel, God among us. I love you, O oh my God. And my only desire is to love you until the last breath of my life. I love you, O oh my infinitely lovable God. And I would rather die loving you than live without loving you. I love you, Lord, and the only grace I ask is to love you eternally. My God, if my tongue cannot say in every moment that I love you, I want my heart to repeat it to you as often as I draw breath. And if you tell me, Father, I find it difficult to pray always, then you pray for that grace, to pray always. And right now we make the intention that for the rest of our life, every beat of our heart is an expression of love for God. Every breath we take is an expression of love for God. Every step we walk, every word we speak, let it be a prayer of praise and adoration and thanksgiving to God who loved us first, and love is repaid by love alone. We have today, we have today to love God, to serve God, to know God. Forget about yesterday. So many people worry about the past. Oh, Father, I couldn't be a saint. You couldn't. You better be. That's what you're on earth for. And if you're still on earth, you still have time. Once you leave the earth, there's no more time. Then all you have is eternity, and that's been determined by your time. And so if you're still on the face of the earth, you can and must be a saint. And that's the only reason for life. And if you get diverted and confused by a thousand and one worldly concerns, stop it. Right now, stop it and change your life. Because the only thing that matters is being sanctified. To know the Lord your God, to love him, and to serve him with your whole heart, mind, and strength. That's what life is all about. That is the meaning of human existence. God's spirit is offered to us each and every moment. This moment. This moment. To live in the present moment. Forget about yesterday. Leave that to God's mercy. Don't worry about tomorrow. Leave that to God's providence. Live the present moment with intensity and with perfection. Today is God's gift to us. That's why it's called the present. Get it? <laughs> Live in the present moment, honestly. Don't be agonizing over your past. God is merciful. And listen, I doubt many people have a worse past than me. And you know, I, I told the sisters about a story. I preached at a prison once, a big prison. And one of the men afterwards, I had given my testimony and I, I uh, had told the man about my own struggles. And I told them that the only difference between them and me is that they got caught. And I'm certainly every bit as bad as they are. And one man, after I did that, he, he came up to me smiling. He, he had lived a, ba a bad life. Uh, now, I never, you know, committed crimes, really, that, you know, murder or robbery or anything like that. But, you know, I was a spiritual, moral criminal. And he came up to me smiling, and he was shaking his head, and he said, Oh, Father, I, I, I've lived a bad life, but I, I have hope. Because if God can forgive you, I know I have a chance. <laughs> he was right. Hope. We've got to bring hope. Live in the present moment. Forget about the past. So you made mistakes. You, even if you committed horrible sins, they're gone. You went to confession, I'm sure. And if you haven't, then do it. And then it's finished. God annihilates sin when he forgives sin. When he forgives, he not only forgets, he destroys the sin. The one who has power to bring all things into being out of nothing simply by willing it can certainly get rid of your sins if you bring them to him. And so forget about the past. Don't worry about it anymore. 
and the future, stop worrying. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Today has trouble enough of its own. Don't worry. Isn't God in the future? Isn't God everywhere? Isn't God in eternity? And doesn't eternity transcend time? God's in your future, just like he's in your past and your present. Don't worry about it. Whatever comes, don't worry. God is there. He knew about it from all eternity, and he will work out everything for your good. Live in the present moment. That's all we have. Live it with holiness and live it with perf perfection. Live and pray the present moment. You know, pray your work. Pray your housework. St. Teresa says, God moves about the pots and pans. Good news, moms, housewives. God's even in the pots and pans. He's even in the humble tasks of, of the home. And so remember that. Remember that your whole life becomes a prayer. We pray to the Father through Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. There is no other way of Christian prayer than Christ, for he says, I am the way. So to, to be a Christian, you know, sometimes people say, but I don't know how to pray. I don't know the way to go, Father. There's so many confusing things. Jesus says, I am the way. And so we enter into his life and his mission. That's all about redemption. And redemption is accomplished through self-sacrifice. Christian love is self-sacrificing love. Please remember that. No cross, no crown. No pain, no gain. No goal, no glory. And there's no way out. And so we live lives of sacrifice. Don't be afraid of sacrifice. Sacrifice is the key that opens the gates of heaven because sacrifice, when done for God and neighbor, is love. Christian love, agape love, charity. Now we pray through Jesus. The prayer of the church is nourished by the word of God and the word of God is not a something. The word is a somebody, the eternal word, the Father's Son. The prayer of the church is nourished by the word of God and the celebration of the liturgy and it teaches us to pray to the Lord Jesus. Now, certain of their psalms, certain of the psalms which are used in the prayer of the church in a veiled way refer to the Messiah, the Savior, who is, who is Jesus. Many, many ways we invoke him. He has so many beautiful titles filled with power. Son of God, Word of God, Lord, Savior, Messiah, Lamb of God, King, Beloved Son, Son of the Virgin, Good Shepherd, our life, our life, our hope, our resurrection, the friend of mankind. So many beautiful titles that express the Lord, but the one which expresses him most is his own name, Jesus. God saves. That's the meaning of the word. God saves. Jesus. The name of Jesus is filled with power. If you could only have one word to pray the rest of your life, it should be the name, the holy name, Jesus. That's filled with power. It's God and the redemptive power of God. God saves. That's the meaning of the name, the holy name of Jesus. You've heard of the Jesus prayer that the uh, Eastern tradition has, uh, the different uh, Eastern rites in the Catholic Church, Maronite rite, Byzantine rite, so many of the beautiful Eastern rites, which are part of the Catholic Church, they're united to the Holy Father, and they're just as Catholic as we are in the Latin rite. And in that Eastern tradition of the Desert Fathers and the, the monks of, uh, of Egypt and Syria, there was a prayer called the Jesus Prayer, which they would pray from the heart all day long. It is an excellent uh, prayer, and it's one of the ways we can practice prayer, even when we're working and doing things. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's power in that prayer, most of all, because it has the name, the holy name of Jesus. You might shorten it and say, Lord Jesus, have mercy. I remember helping 
a dying man once. He was in great pain, suffering from cancer for many months. And towards the end, he was a man of prayer, daily communicant. He'd been in my parish at home for many years, coming to communion every day for many, many years. And he was so weak and sick at the end, he, he couldn't pray. His prayer books were stacked up next to him, his rosary. And he said, I, I'm so sad, Father, I can't even reach to lift up my prayer book. I'm so weak, and my, I'm, I'm in pain. I'm in great pain, so I can't concentrate. Of course, he was on the cross, which is where the most powerful prayer takes place. And I said, Jim, just say the word Jesus from your heart over and over with love, Jesus, Jesus. And, and he said, I think I can do that, Father. I, I, I believe I can hold on to that one word, even though I can't think. I'm in terrible pain. You know, I'm distracted. And, and, but I think I can do that. And he did it. The last days of his life, and the nurse told me that his last breath was Jesus. And then he expired. What a beautiful way to live, and what a beautiful way to die with the holy name of Jesus, always on our lips. The prayer of the church venerates and honors the sacred heart of Jesus, just as it invokes his most holy name. The sacred heart, devotion to the sacred heart of Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, the First Friday uh, devotion is a beautiful thing. You know, often we hear, have heard in recent years that these devotions are passe, that we don't, shouldn't really have them, whether it be the rosary, the stations of the cross, novenas, uh, all of these devotions. I've heard it myself. I, I, when I, before I was a priest, I had people tell me, oh, we don't do that anymore. That's not where the church is. Well, wrong. Sorry. Uh, that is what we do, and that is what the church wants, and it's right in the catechism. And the Holy Father has taught consistently that we should preserve the devotions of the church. Why? Because they help the people. And we need all the help we can get. The Stations of the Cross, especially during Lent, all the different Marian devotions, devotions to the saints, that helps bring us closer to Jesus. Why? Because the saints are the best friends of the Lord Jesus. They're the ones who lived his life with most fidelity. And so the church wants us to preserve the, the devotions which the church has approved. And there are, are many. We can't say Jesus is Lord except through the Holy Spirit, Scripture tells us. And so we should pray, of course, in the name of Jesus, but the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us to do that. It's grace. To be able to invoke the name of Jesus is a grace. The Holy Spirit is the one who, who moves us in that direction. Every good inspiration ultimately comes from the Holy Spirit. We have little prayers. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. We all know that little prayer. You could say that little invocation before you read the Bible or before you undertake anything important. You know, let's say you have to make a decision. Uh, I don't know which school to send my child to. I don't know uh, where I should take a job. I have two or three different things. I don't really know what to do. Invoke the Holy Spirit. Bring God into everything. Come Holy Spirit. Always do things with the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, whose anointing permeates our entire being, is the interior master of Christian prayer. He is the artisan of the living tradition of prayer. Don't be afraid to give yourself over to the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I did that very early in my vocation. I gave myself to the Holy Spirit through Our Lady, the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid to do that. You know, when you let go, uh, you don't give away your freedom. You set your freedom free. Because the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, true life, true freedom, true goodness, he's a good master. And he won't deceive you and he won't let you down. And so don't be afraid to invoke the Holy Spirit and to give yourself to the Holy Spirit. Because if you do that, 
he will begin more powerfully than ever to conform you to Jesus. And that's who we're to be in the world. The shortcut to all this, the answer to all the problems of the world, when enough of us become, through grace, the living presence of Jesus in the world, then the problems of the world will be overcome. And until that happens, the problems of the world will not be overcome. And they will not be cured by merely humanistic approaches. All of the horror of war, poverty, indifference, not caring about certain disadvantaged groups of people, that ha we need social programs, we need to have government programs, those things are all important. But those things will never, once and for all, solve the problems. The problem will be solved only, only when enough of us become saints. And that means to become Jesus to the world. And that's a function of the Holy Spirit. We know that we, we act in communion with Mary, the mother of the Lord. Mary gave her total consent to God. She said, fiat, yes, to the Lord at the Annunciation. And what happened? A little girl said yes to God. Now, Our Lady couldn't have been more than about 15 at the time the angel Gabriel visited her. She was praying like a good Jew for the coming of the Messiah. And what happened? God announced his plan to her. Well, she didn't understand it completely. How can this be? I know not man. And not only that, she was consecrated to the, Lord, to the Lord from her earliest years. Consecrated in virginity is what it means. And so she didn't understand. And the angel told her, the power of the Holy Spirit shall overshadow you. Now, I, I don't know that she understood completely what that meant. But she said, well, if it's God's will, be it done unto me according to your word. Can we say that in union with Our Lady? Can we say, be it done unto me according to your word, O Lord? Or do we say, well, you know, my way or the highway? Well, you know, let's make it his way. Because he says, I am the way. And that way leads to heaven. It leads to life. It leads to everything good. So Our Lady shows us how to do that. There are countless hymns and prayers to Our Lady, which have two essential movements to them. They alternate with one another. The first magnifies the Lord, praises God for the great things that he has done for the lowly. The second entrusts the supplications and praises of the children of God to the mother of Jesus because she knows the humanity which in her the Son of God espoused. This twofold mo movement of, of praise an entrustment of our needs to our Blessed Mother, that finds it's a beautiful expression in the prayer of the Hail Mary, a very beautiful prayer, the Hail Mary. And the Catechism goes into um, an exposition of the Hail Mary, a powerful prayer, a magnificent prayer, one of the first prayers we learn it as children, and don't ever think that any of us become too sophisticated to stop praying the Hail Mary. Never. I don't care if you're a great mystic and a saint. You still pray the Hail Mary and the Our Father. We never outgrow those prayers, no matter how exalted and lofty our uh, contemplative prayer may become. Always we pray the Hail Mary, because it's a, it's a prayer of power. Hail, rejoice, Mary, the greeting of the angel Gabriel said. It opens the prayer. It is God himself through his messenger, his angel, which greets Mary this way. Our prayer, the Catechism says, dares to take up this greeting to Mary with the regard God had for the lowliness of his humble handmaid and to exult in the joy he finds in her. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Mary is full of grace quite simply because the Lord is with her. And because she's full of grace, she's capacitated for her exalted mission as mother of God and the first and greatest disciple of the Lord Jesus. And so Our Lady brings us into this prayer. When we pray the Hail Mary, the Hail Mary is centered on Jesus. 
blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. That's the focal point of the Hail Mary. All Marian devotion begins with Christ, is centered on Christ, and ends with Christ. Our Lady, as she did at Cana, says, do everything he, he, tells you to do. So she points to Jesus. So Marian devotion is Christocentric. Our Lady leads us into a relationship with her son. That's her vocation. That's her call from God. That's the only thing she wants, to draw us to Jesus, who brings us to the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Mary is blessed among all women because she believed in the fulfillment of the Lord's word. Abraham, because of his faith, the catechism says, became a blessing for all the nations of the earth. And Mary, because of her faith, became the mother of all believers. We can say the mother of all the living. Remember in Genesis, we spoke of Eve as the mother of all the living. But because of her disobedience, Eve became the mother of all the dead and dying because of sin. But Our Lady unties the knot of Eve's disobedience. And in so doing, she becomes the mother of all the living. And that means that Our Lady is our spiritual mother, a mother in the order of grace. We're talking about real life, transcendent, supernatural life, the life that never ends. And Our Lady, spouse of the Holy Spirit, intercedes with her spouse, the Holy Spirit, and he inter overshadows us as he did her, and the Word mystically becomes flesh again and dwells among us. So Our Lady helps us a great deal. Holy Mary, Mother of God, with Elizabeth, we marvel. Why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And I could say the same thing. O oh Lord, in all my sins and misery, why do you give me such a mother? Why did she come to me and rescue me from the gutter? I marvel with Elizabeth. How is it that the mother of my Lord comes to me, but she does. She comes to every one of us because she's filled with the love who is her son, Holy Mary, Mother of God. Just think, our spiritual mother is the mother of God. Jesus is God, and she is his mother. And so we have a powerful and loving mother, and we entrust ourselves to her. The rosary is a powerful prayer. You know, the rosary kind of, it's, well, it's the prayer of the gospel, quite simply. You know, that last part of the Hail Mary, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. If you have ever worried about the hour of your death, maybe all of us do one time or another, not that we're preoccupied with it. I have worried about it. I just hope that God finds me in good condition at the hour of my death. And when I pray the rosary and the Hail Mary, you know, when I pray it from the heart with, with, with meaning, with, with uh, feeling, with conviction, I become convinced that Our Lady will be with me now and at the hour of my death. Hmm? Pray for us sinners. It's a humble admission. Now, you know, there are some people who think they aren't sinners and, and they have a problem. I, I can't imagine, I, maybe it's because I'm, I, I guess, well, I, I can't help but notice that I'm a sinner. I know it. I know where I've been. And uh, so I know that I'm a sinner. I don't have a problem saying, pray for us sinners. You know, I could put in big, bold letters, pray for me, a sinner. It wouldn't bother me a bit because I know it's true. But today we have a false sense of humanism. Now, humanism in its proper sense is good. But there's a secular humanism, which is not good. And that would say that we're not sinners. We're good. I heard a story about someone who wouldn't sing the song Amazing Grace because they didn't want to say the line that saved a wretch like me. <laughs> and they said, well, I'm not a wretch. Well, maybe not in one way, but in another way, we're all sinners. And so it's good and healthy. It's healthy 
not to beat up on ourselves, but to acknowledge the reality, yes, we're sinners. That's the truth. I am a sinner. The other part of the truth is God loves me and will give me the grace to overcome my sinfulness. And so it has two sides. I acknowledge that I'm weak, that I'm a sinner, but I also acknowledge that God loves me. God loves us even in our sins. He doesn't love our sins. He doesn't love the fact we're committing sin, but he loves us. He loves us. I assure you, the worst sinner in history was loved by God. Even in the midst of his sins, God didn't love the sins. God didn't love the fact that he was sinning. But God loves the soul and tries to save it by pouring out even more love to draw it to himself. And so the prayer of the rosary is a powerful prayer. And I highly recommend that any of you who have listened to me long enough know that I say that it's not just vain repetition, saying the same thing over again. It can be that. It can be that if that's your understanding and if that's the way you approach it. But the rosary is the prayer of the gospel. Thirteen of the fifteen mysteries are directly out of the gospels. The gospel is the heart of our faith. The gospel Good news, it means. The gospel is not a something. The gospel is a somebody. Jesus Christ is the good news. And when we pray the good news, when we pray the gospel, we pray Jesus, we interiorize him, and we become who we are, the image of the invisible God, because Jesus the Lord is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. I'm going to get, just to conclude this hour, some notes that last week during the retreat I gave, Mother Teresa, in a spiritual way, taught me some things, many things, about prayer. And I'll just briefly share them with you. The absolute primacy of prayer. Now, I touched on that at the beginning. If you will pray, everything will fall into place. If you struggle with the faith, you don't understand certain things, you have difficulty to accept certain things. I totally sympathize with that. And my advice to you is pray. Pray for what, Father? Pray for the gift of faith. Pray that your difficulty will be taken care of. And it will. It really will. Uh, if you have difficulty with hope, you say, I'm losing hope. I'm discouraged. Everything's gone wrong. The world's falling apart. My children are pagans. My advice to you, pray. But pray for what, Father? Pray for hope. Pray that that theological virtue be increased in you. And you say, and Father, I can't love. I, I would be a liar to say that I love God above all things for his own sake, and I love my neighbor as myself out of love for God. I lack that. I don't have the fullness of it. I don't feel it. And then I tell you, you must pray for charity. You must pray. Follow our lady's example. Silence. You have to practice silence to be a person of prayer. God is the friend of silence. God is the friend of silence. God speaks to us in the silence of our heart. And you say, but I'm a busy mother and I have no silence. Then you must make it. Then you must make it. Go aside. But you say, but I, I just don't have time. Get up 4 o'clock in the morning. And I'm dead serious. That's what I have to do. You say, I, well, I have two babies, and I get up earlier than that. Matter of fact, I'm up all night. Good, pray. Pray. <laughs> While you're changing those diapers, whoa, pray. That's a humble task. And humility is a foundation of prayer. So pray doing those humble things. But you have to have some silence. Try to go aside. Even if it's very difficult, make time for silence. Remember this, Mother Teresa says, and I'm using Mother Teresa of Calcutta as a very real, concrete example because she's one of those rare individuals, like the Holy Father, that the Church has given throughout history. Every period of history has its saintly people, and Mother Teresa of Calcutta is one of them. She knows God. She's a real friend. She's close, intimate with Jesus. Mother says the fruit of silence is faith. Silence intensifies our faith. 
And the fruit of faith is prayer. When we're filled with faith, we can pray because we believe that our prayers are heard and that God loves us. And so the fruit of faith is prayer. And the fruit of prayer is love. When we pray, we enter more deeply into Jesus, who is love. And the fruit of love, that's service. If you love your neighbor as yourself out of love for God, you will not be indifferent when millions of people are starving to death all over the face of the earth. You will not be indifferent to the cry of the poor. You will not be indifferent to the homeless wandering about cold in the streets of our own country. You will not be indifferent to the cry of the unborn who ask only one thing, that they be allowed to live. If you have love, you will be sensitive. And in order to have love, you have to pray. The fruit of love is service. We will serve. Jesus said, I have come to serve, not to be served. Do we come as servants? Do we come as servants? Asking only, what can I do for you? Not what you can do for me. That's how Jesus came. And the fruit of service is silence. It's a circle. It goes around. It begins with the silence of the heart, which allows us it to enter into the eternal silence of the Trinity. From all eternity, God spoke but one word, in the eternal silences of the Trinity, the eternal word. And in that one word, he has said everything. And he has no more to say. But in order to understand that one only word, the eternal word, Jesus, you have to enter into the silence of God. Allow him to speak to your heart. That silence will beget faith in you. That faith will beget prayer. That prayer will beget love. That love will beget service. And then you'll go forth serving the least of all brethren out of love for God. And people will look at a Catholic and say, look at those Catholics, how they love one another. And they will flock to the church. And we won't have churches big enough or numerous enough to contain all the people that will come rushing and fall at the feet of the Eucharistic Lord.